Welcome to the district. I'm your Fulton County Commissioner of District 4, Natalie Hall. We will have the special honor to hear from Ms. Zernona Clayton, a trailblazer, creator, storyteller, civil rights legend, influencer, and a Black history icon. Ms. Clayton is the founder, president, and CEO of the Trumpet Awards Foundation Incorporated and creator and executive producer of the Foundation's Trumpet Awards. The Trumpet Awards is a prestigious event highlighting African-American accomplishments and contributions initiated in 1993 by Turner Broadcasting. The Trumpet Awards has been televised annually and distributed internationally to over 185 countries around the world. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back. Welcome back to the district. I'm your Fulton County Commissioner of District 4, Natalie Hall. Joining us today is Ms. Zernona Clayton. Ms. Clayton moved to Atlanta in 1965, where she accepted a position with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and worked closely with the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Ms. Clayton also traveled extensively with Mrs. Coretta Scott King on her nationwide concert tours. Ms. Clayton began her television career in 1967 and became the South's first Black person to have ever owned television show. Dedicated to promoting racial understanding, Zernona Clayton has been a leader in civic projects and civil rights activities for several years. Her persistent fight against the dragons of prejudice and bigotry was never more apparent than in 1968 when the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan denounced the Klan and credited Zernona's influence with his change. Ms. Clayton has been honored with Spelman College Local Community Service Award, the State of Georgia Commission on Equal Opportunity Leadership and Dedication in Civil Rights Award, Coretta Scott King Award, the Madam C.J. Walker Award, and the Outstanding Corporate Professional Award from the Power Networking family. Ms. Clayton, again, thank you for joining us on the district. How are you? Well, being here with you makes me say I'm really okay. <laughs> I'm in the right company. Mm -hmm. Well, we are so glad to have you on the district today. Please tell us more about yourself and your life. Well, I've been blessed, really, to have had so many opportunities. Um, and there were the opportunities for many things, really. I was going to say just for health. But I'll start with that for, I guess, 90 some years now. I'll be 90. I think I'll be 92 uh, this year. And um, I have been blessed with good health all these years. I've been blessed with some sanity most of those years, uh, <laughs> the other years, um, and the opportunity to meet people and be in places and make things happen. I've been fortunate that I've had challenging assignments and I met them with sincerity and with full-blown commitment and made them work. So when I recapitulate my life I think I have to say I've had a good life, a busy life, a fulfilled life, and um, I'm really grateful to the good Lord for that. Well, Ms. Clayton, many know you as an American civil rights leader. What was one of your most memorable experiences with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that the history books nor the media share with us? Well, one of the things is like every day um, when you're around Dr. King, you feel like you've grown a little taller because you understand a little more, meaning that he taught us uh, to understand why we are struggling, trying to fight, trying to make a difference, trying to uh, fill the bill of 
make an equality a reality, which was very challenging. And he also taught us one of the things I really liked about him is that Dr. King loved everybody. He didn't just have it as a um, password. He loved everybody. He said, it doesn't make sense for us not to love each other. Each of us was created in the image of our good Lord. And underneath the skin, we're all the same. And he made us feel that way, that we should not hate our brothers who didn't look like us, that maybe you could do something to help change them. I never knew that and never would have thought that I'd have one of the best examples, you know, like working with uh, the Ku Klux Klan, a leader. And so, you know, that gives me a reason to, you know, put my chest out pretty far. If I can change the uh, Grand Dragon, then maybe I could do something else as well. Um, and it makes you fortified that change can be made and the difference will be uh, thrilling for everybody. Yes, yes. And you've been blessed to see the world progress in so many ways. What has been one of your favorite progressions that you've seen in this world? Um, well, I um, remember, I don't enjoy remembering, but I guess it helps me move forward. Uh, when I first faced the real examples of bigotry, I mean, I live in a small town. I'm from Oklahoma, small state, small city. Um, but uh, you had the black community on one side of town, the whites on the other. So I grew up in a segregated environment, but uh, my father was very active in the community and uh, my sister and I were very active. And so we didn't feel the pain as much. So it wasn't until we went to college, which was in Nashville, Tennessee, we went to Tennessee State University. And it was in Nashville where I got my first real example, the real painful example. Uh, we'd gone out uh, for the evening, uh, boys and girls, you know, dating. And on the way back to the dorm, everybody was a little hungry, said, you know, let's stop and get a hamburger. We were passing a hamburger place and everybody thought that was a great idea. We stopped, we all had money to pay for what we wanted, got out of the car to go in. And the man, I guess he was the owner, we didn't stay long enough to find out what his title was, but he looked like and acted like the owner. And he was standing there with a knife that looked like it was a foot long, a big butcher knife. And so we said, we want hamburgers. He picked that knife up and let it shine on all of us in a reflective way. He said, if you don't get out of here, I'm gonna take this knife and cut your heads off, all of you. You know you don't belong here. We were shocked and frightened. And I can tell you something. To hear him say you don't belong here, I had a chance to hear that many more times later. That white people often said, you know, you don't belong here. I found it painful then, and it was painful every time I faced that. And I had decided that'll never happen to me again. I'll never let anybody talk to me like that because I do belong here. And I'm not gonna be afraid anymore. I was really fearful. All of us were. We were, you know, students, so we were young people. We never had anybody do that to show the bigotry so blatantly. Like he said, I'll cut your heads off because you know you don't belong here. Like we were, knew we were invading, you know, wrongful territory. Well, I heard it again and again, and I couldn't take it because um, the law says that I belonged here. On the books, it was clearly stated that everybody who looked like me belong here, we're all Americans. And somehow I found strength in that rejection because I just stood firmly like, I'm gonna strike down or help to fight the dragon of prejudice. Every place I go, nobody's gonna ever talk to me like that again. You don't belong here. It was sort of like you're in a foreign country that you've invaded territory that doesn't belong to you and you're on, in the wrong place. 
and I knew better. Well, it strengthened me uh, to the point that I was willing to face any struggle to see to it that nobody would ever say that again. They did, but I was ready to fight it out wherever that ugly head raised itself. And so I got courage from that. It was still painful, but I got courage from that. Like, how dare him talk to me like this? How dare him say, I don't belong here. I'm in foreign soil, untapped territory. I do belong here. And so I feel like from that point forward, I'm gonna see to it that I belong where I am. I'm not going in places, don't trespass, of course. But any place in this America, I feel like I have a right to belong there. And so he strengthened me really. It wasn't a good, um, easy lesson, but it was a substantive lesson. Ms. Clayton, you have just fought through so much adversity and and just and been successful and and you are a testament to how we should respond to racism today. But looking back, is there anything you would have done differently as it relates to the, the civil rights movement, the trumpet awards, or just in your life? Oh, what a question. Um, I'm not sure I would do anything differently because everything that I did was prompted by something else. Um, like um, when, when I discovered, I, I found out though that I'm fearless. Um, I was never afraid after that. Um, I shook, I think for a long time, but that scared me to death. I've never seen a, a knife that long. That never had him by the didn't belong there. So he really strengthened me like nobody's going to talk to me like that again. It gives you that strong back where you can stand tall and stand up. Um, so I had opportunities then. I didn't, I'm not a fighter when I said I'm not a pugilist, um, but I will stand up for what is right. So I've made some changes uh, or helped to make changes in our society for the better. Uh, by working for there was discrimination and um, violence and um, unloved uh, people for no reason at all. I've helped to change people's attitudes. And that's the part that gives me the courage to keep trying it again and again and again. So I've had good luck in changing negative attitudes. And that really makes me feel good because Dr. King said, if you change a man's heart, you can change his behavior. And I believe that strongly. When you make people think right, they'll act right. And so um, I've had some many things. You don't have enough time for me to cite them to you. But I've had some wonderful moments in my life trying to right the wrongs uh, where I existed and others as well. And we see that you are so very successful in all that you do. And of course, you're young and beautiful. Can you please share with us? <laughs> you are young and beautiful. Oh, I like that part. <laughs> <laughs> Will you please share with us what you feel has molded and contributed to you being the amazing woman that we see before us today? Uh, well, I uh, thank you for the compliment, but you know what I think, um, I, I grew up in a very loving home. I think the good Lord really took care uh, of us as children to be born in a wonderful home. Uh, two parents who loved us, but made us do right. Um, they corrected us when we messed up, uh, punished us when we did wrong, um, taught us the lessons all the time of, of that which will govern our lives for the future. and. So, which means like now my mother and father both have gone on to glory and have been for some time. But to this day, uh, Commissioner, I really still feel the lessons that I learned at home, like feed the hungry and clothe the naked. My father was a minister. And so you hear the biblical passages all the time, feed the hungry, share with other folk. You know, if you've got a lot, or if you don't have a lot, if you have something to eat, share it with somebody. And so I've never had trouble doing that because I grew up 
knowing that it's a good thing to do is to be kind to your neighbor, love thy neighbor as ourself. And I really try hard to do that. Um, so I'm fearless when it comes to taking on a challenge, especially if it's for the benefit of for somebody else. And I think I'm unselfish enough that I really enjoy sharing whatever it is that I have um, that will benefit somebody else's life. So I think it's my upbringing that made me, um, I guess, live the life I'm living today uh, to be kind to folk, even if they're not kind to you, you know, you can't, I, I think it's very difficult to love everybody, but you're supposed to try. And I try, it's kind of hard sometimes, but I try. <laughs> yes, I do agree. Well, Ms. Clayton, thank you. And let's take a quick break. And when we return, we'll continue our discussion with Ms. Clayton regarding the insight she would give her 21-year-old self and her legacy. You don't want to miss it. We'll be right back. Okay, Dad. One, two, three. Ah! you now and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. Welcome back to the district. I'm your Fulton County Commissioner of District 4, Natalie Hall. If you are just joining us, we have the honor of having Ms. Zernona Clayton on the district. We've been discussing her life as a civil rights leader and a trailblazer. Ms. Clayton, thank you again for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. And what insight with the Zernona you are today share with the 21-year-old Zernona? Well, if it were a woman uh, as I am, I would tell uh, women I meet, be fearless. Don't take the competition uh, so hard. I think we're in a war now of competition. I'm gonna prove that I'm a woman, I'm gonna get this job and I'm gonna do that. I, I just think that we don't need to do that. If you feel the confidence within your spirit, it will give you the courage to stand up and say, I'm here, I'm ready to do the job, I'm up to the task, I'm qualified to do it, give me an opportunity. Um, and not just because you're a woman. I, I, I'm not one of the women who just says, because I'm a woman, I need to be treated special. Just treat me like I am. Um, and if you can judge uh, from the external, that's what you have uh, when you're meeting face to face. If I look like I can do it, I probably can't. And I have enough courage within myself that I'll try anything. Um, if it's something I'm looking for, to prove my skill and talent and ability, uh, you'll know it in very short order uh, that I'm up to the task. Cause, Cause I have an attitude of competence. I wouldn't get into something. I'm not out to play football cause I can't play football, but there's something I can do. If I show up, I probably feel sure inside of me that I can do this and end up proving it. Uh, my success rate, you know, um, confirms it. Uh, that everything I've set out to do, um, I've just about done it. I've sometimes wonder what didn't I do that I missed out on, and I can't say that I did. Um, I've been not fortunate. I've been blessed to have met most of the challenges I've met in my uh, mature years. Maybe as a youngster, I didn't do it, but I was kind of a... Um, uh, a stalwart fighter uh, as a youngster. I mean, I wanted to be the first one to report uh, whatever was the subject matter of the day in school. I wanted to be first and I ended up being um, what they call the smartest. We had in, in my high school, we had 
the smartest boy and the smartest girl, which means the ones that made the, the highest grades. And I kept saying all the time, I'm, when I get up there, I'm going to be the smartest girl. And I was. And I, um, they gave me a set of luggage. And I kept that luggage for years. I mean, it almost wore out before I got rid of it. Um, but I set my sights on what is the prize at the end. What does this entail? What's in it for me? What role will I play? Will I benefit? And these are questions I ask myself. And I'm not greedy. I'm not looking for the next thing. I'm looking for this thing, whatever is before me. I want to do good at it and excel in it. And I have this strong urge always to come out on top. And I think it served me well over all these years. It absolutely has served you well. And you have an amazing legacy. And just thinking about that legacy, how would you like for the world to remember you? That I did everything I could as long as I could. That's not a new saying, but I picked it up along the way and it's so apropos for me that that's what I hope people will say because even today, I really have no selfishness about myself. Someone wants some clothes, I'll share it with them. Someone needs food, I will certainly see that they get it. If somebody is looking for a roof over their head, I'll try to see how I can help provide that. Um, I'm an unselfish person. That's not being braggadocious about it. It's just that that's the way I am. I wish I had more to share. You know, I have no money. I have no wealth. Um, I do what I can where I can. You know, I don't try to, you know, provide a mansion for anybody. They just want a place to stay. And I'll help do that. They're hungry. They don't have to have steak. You know, a hamburger will work. If you're hungry, anything can fill your gut will work. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sharing and I, I'm kind of thick skinned in that uh, I'm not worried about what people say about me. You know, everybody doesn't have to like you. And the good book says, you know, they may not. Um, but I'm not looking for popularity at all. Not at all. I want to do what I can, where I can as long as I can, for the benefit of me and V. I love that. And you do continue to serve and work with many people and organizations. Everyone knows Zernona Clayton. Can you please share with us what you're doing now and any plans you have for the future? Yes, do more of the same. <laughs> you know, I, um, I think some of the projects that I've kind of come up and created uh, uh, when the, the time things, conditions blow over, I want to be able to resume some of my projects. Um, I think one of the best things, um, in addition to the Trumpet Awards, everybody uh, likes the Trumpet Awards, but it now belongs to Bounce. Uh, but they keep me, you know, kind of with my hands in it. Um, but I'm proud that it was something they wanted um, and they bought it and are doing great work with it. Um, and I'm closely connected enough with them that I feel like I'm still a member of the family, so to speak. I don't try to run it. Um, I tell people all the time, you know, when you sell your house, you can't go back in it and tell the, the new owners you were red carpet and, <laughs> and blue furniture is no longer yours. So I don't, try, I don't try to tell Bounce how to bounce up on the, the right things and the truck awards, it's theirs. But I'm glad to be a party uh, to some of its decision-making. I, I'm flattered that they include me. But the Civil Rights Walk of Fame, the International Civil Rights Walk of Fame, I'm very proud of that project. Uh, it's where we take uh, real shoes from real people who made a real difference in our world. And it's international and it has to do with civil rights, people who have shared their lives and their, um, the fashion uh, of their speed and success rate uh, can share it with others. So we keep it going, keep it going that you spread the message uh, to others and 
make the world stronger through the work that other people have have made. So I'm very proud of that. And I'm going to continue that as soon as you know, time permits. Um, so uh, at, at, in the 90s, no, I'm not ready to you know, take on new challenges. I'll just take what I've been doing and expand on it. Uh, I'm not um, unrealistic. Of course, the good book says nobody knows the day nor the hour. I mean, I could be here today and gone tomorrow, but I don't worry about that. I worry about, you know, when I wake up tomorrow, if I wake up, I'll just make the most of that day. That's what I did this morning. Uh, but that's what I do every morning. I wake up looking around and see, gee, I'm really up. I'm alive. I can do something today. There's always something to do. And um, Commissioner, that's the, the motto that I kind of live by. There's always something to do. You know, people are struggling. People are hungry. People mm -hmm. are in need. People are unloved. People are in violent settings. People have ignorance abounding. There's something you could do. I remember when I lived in Chicago, we had a very, very wealthy uh, man about town who was successful in his business. He had a wife and three children. And he asked me one night, could he come to my home? And I lived alone at that time. And um, right away, I was uncomfortable with the request. Um, flirtatious uh, is what I thought was his calling card. And I didn't want that. But I felt strong enough and secure enough that I said, yes, you can come to my home. And guess what he wanted? This was a rich man. He said to me, somehow, since I've known you, you look like somebody I can trust. And I've got a secret to share. You know, feel like I can share it with you. He said, I've got three children. I don't even know how to spell their names. I hear my wife calling their names and I repeat after her, but I can't even spell their names. I don't know how to read or write. Would you teach me how to read? Because I think you'd be the only one I'd trust not to tell anybody. And he said, I'd be willing to pay you. Well, my pay was, I did teach him. I felt guilty like I was having a clandestine relationship, but he never got flirtatious with me. He was there for serious business, and I treated it just like that, that I taught him how to read. And he said, if his children found out he couldn't read, that he could not read, they would be disappointed. And he said, I don't want that. And I'll never forget that request of me. And so we carried on this little relationship where uh, I finally told his wife, because I didn't want her like catching her husband at my house and uh, not understanding it. So she understood. I shared the secret with her, but I said, but please don't tell him because I promised. And so she kept the secret and she was happy about it because now she also wished he could read and write. And so by my helping him, it helped her. So as the children grew, uh, I kept up with them for a long time uh, that they never knew. He didn't know how to write, read. Um, I've had some moments like that in my life. Uh, but the good part about this is that he tried to pay me because I didn't want any pay. But my pay was now he can read and write and the children will never know his secret. He could buy them whatever they wanted because he was very successful in his business, but he couldn't read or write. I mean, couldn't spell and whatever. He had limitations in that area and he trusted me enough to help him get his uh, feeling of, of um, comfort. And that's what I did. And I still remember that to this day. And that was a long, long time ago. Wow, you literally changed his life, his wife's yes. life, and the wife of his, enti his entire family. That yes. is amazing. So speaking of getting in contact with you, how can anyone who may want to contact you reach you? Is there a website or a phone number or a, someone on your staff? Is there, is there a way that people can contact you? 
Yes, uh, well, I'm listed uh, as a, we still carry the phone number of the Trumpet Awards, although uh, we don't have any, I still do work with that umbrella because uh, uh, people are not familiar with it. So I'm listed as the, the Trumpet Awards. And of course I have my friend who's with me and um, she just, uh, she used to work full time for me when I had a full staff. And uh, she's with me right now, sitting beside me and she's moved on. I tell people that she, she left me, uh, but she realized that she really didn't leave me. I wouldn't let her go. Um, but she just kind of helps me um, knowing that I have my limitations too. And so, but I'm easy to reach uh, through her or through uh, just listed in the telephone, the Trumpet Awards Foundation. And I have my own foundation, the Zerona Clayton Foundation. So either one, you can get me um, and I'd be happy to share any experiences I have with other people. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Clayton, for sharing with us about your life, your love for community, the successes and the many amazing experiences that you've had in your lifetime. And we hope to see you live many more happy and healthy days on this earth. Um, and when we return, we'll share, I'll share my closing thoughts. Welcome back to the district. I'm your Fulton County Commissioner of District 4, Natalie Hall. It was a pleasure to have Mr. Nona Clayton on the district today. A trailblazer, creator, storyteller, civil rights legend, influencer, and a Black history icon. We discussed with Ms. Clayton about the insight she would give her 21-year-old self and her legacy, why she continues to serve and work with many people and organizations, what has contributed to her being the woman she is today, plus her most memorable experiences with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that the history books don't share with us. Fulton County government will continue to keep you updated via our website at FultonCountyGA.gov. And please remember, we are running for the month of March, the celebration of Women's History Month. We will honor Zernona Clayton, her legacy, her impact, her story on Fulton Government TV station, channel 21 in Atlanta, channel 23 in North and South Fulton, and channel 26 in College Park in East Point. Please tune in and watch the Zernona Clayton story. And as it relates to the COVID pandemic, testing, masks, and vaccinations, please continue to social distance, wash your hands, wear your mask, get vaccinated, and have a discussion with your medical provider regarding any other precautions that you should take. And please follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Fulco D4, that's F-U-L-C-O-D and the number four. That's our show for today. I'm your Fulton County Commissioner of District 4, Natalie Hall, and thank you for watching the district. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America.
you.